Hello, this is the orientation video for the Bay's Boat Rental 24-foot Bay Weld Gondola. The first step in operating the boat is turning on the battery switch. The battery switch is located next to the driver's helm. The battery switch has two indents on it. Uh, the first one is the on position, and that's where the boat is operated in normal operation. When the battery switch is in the on position, the two batteries on the boat are both automatically charged whenever the engine is running, and then both automatically separated whenever the engine is off. If you find that the boat's not functioning correctly with the battery switch in the on position, the switch can be turned a second click to the position which says combined batteries. When in the combined batteries location, the both batteries are tied together permanently to assist in an emergency start. The risk there, however, is that if in the combined batteries position, both batteries can also be killed um, by running electronics, etc. So, unless something's wrong, just turn the battery switch to the first on position. There's also a note on how to set the battery switch located next to the controls. To start the main engine, just turn the key. Uh, before starting the main engine, make sure that it is all the way in the down position. There's no adjustment needed when starting the main engine. Uh, just turn the key and it will crank. It's always a good idea to start the engine first thing when you get to the boat. Um, that gives a little bit of time to warm up. When operating the boat, we always keep these top two breakers in the on position. So the top one is electronics, the lower is accessory. Beyond those two breakers uh, are the nav lights, then the anchor light, then the main cabin lights, then the heater. Uh, this boat's equipped with a diesel S-bar heater, so to operate that, first turn the breaker on, then over in front of the passenger helm, is the control for the heater. So to start that heater, you press the power button twice, it says heater enabled, and then the startup process will begin. There's a brain within the switch, uh, which will only allow the heater to operate if conditions are correct, so they can be glitchy. If it doesn't start the first time, hit the button twice to stop it, uh, then turn it back on by doing the same thing. Sometimes it will take multiple cycles for the heater to kick off. The next breaker on the breaker panel is for the windlass. That's the anchor winch up front. That needs to be in the on position to function. The windlass up and down switch is below the shifter for the main engine. To bring it up, press the button in the up position. To drop it, press it down. Before the anchor will go down, you'll typically need to run a couple feet of line out of the anchor winch. To create some slack, then have someone go up and push the, push the actual anchor overboard to get it to fall. After that, it can all be run from inside the boat. When bringing the anchor back up, if the line or chain starts to bind, you can see there's a black door underneath the anchor winch uh, to clear out that line or pack it down, open up that door, and then you can access the line pile. It's really important that you make sure no one is running the switch while another person is manipulating the anchor. Make sure that you just have one person be the one to go back and forth between the no switch. No wake in the harbor. To go back and forth to the switch to ensure that it doesn't accidentally get run while hands are in the line pile or on the winch. Anchoring is typically one of the most dangerous things that people will do in Cook Inlet. There have been stories on smaller boats where the anchor has been dropped and as it hooks up to the bottom it can pull hard enough to start to pull the boat under. To combat that we've got a dedicated anchor knife which we keep up front by the winch if a renter ever gets in trouble with the anchor. Sometimes the best option is to just cut the anchor line to take the load off and give yourself time to think. It's also very important that you only anchor the boat off the bow. Um, a couple people had died in Cook Inlet a few years ago after they'd anchored the boat off the stern. Doing that had turned the stern of the boat into the waves and current, which took it down. There are two 
uh, breakers in the anchor winch system. The first one is located below the driver's helm. It has a label on it. Uh, so if the anchor winch quit working, that would be the first place to look. The second is an inline fuse under the anchor winch itself. That's accessed by opening up the black door, which allows you to get to the line, and then the fuse is fixed up to the, to the ceiling of that compartment. More fuses can be found in the orange tackle box under the starboard bench seat inside. The vessel is equipped with three VHF radios, two are hard mounted, and the third one is a handheld. The handheld radio has its own internal battery. Uh, the idea with that is if the renter killed the boat's main batteries, you could still use the handheld VHF to make an emergency call out. Both hard mounted VHFs are also equipped with an internal GPS. So if you see right here, uh, that latitude longitude is your vessel's location. So if you were speaking with the Coast Guard and you needed to tell them where you were, you could read off those numbers. Uh, channel 16 is the Coast Guard channel. So if you had to do a distress call or needed to hail another vessel, channel 16 would be the place to do it. These hard mounted VHFs are also equipped with a distress button. So to activate that, you flip open the red cover, press the red button inside, and then instructions on the screen will show up with how to send out the distress signal. This distress system built into the VHFs is a pretty neat new feature. It, uh, it sends your distress signal out through the radio waves, so it accesses all boats within a radio range, and those are the first ones which will have access to come and help. This will take over the other boats radio system, put them on the same channel as you, uh, turn their volume up all the way, and it will even plot a course from where they're at to where you're at. To adjust the volume on these radios, use the upper knob, uh, turn it to the right, gets you more, counterclockwise, turns it down. That upper knob is also used for the squelch, that's the sensitivity of the radio, so to access that function, press it once, comes up with squelch, and then turn the knob counterclockwise until the radio squelches, then up just enough to silence it. People have a bad habit of assuming that more is better with all these knobs, but squelch is the opposite of that. So the more your squelch is turned down, the more sensitive your radio is. To adjust the channel on the radio, use the big lower knob. Um, that allows you to flip through channels. This lower knob also allows you to access the weather channels on the radio. If you look in the lower left hand corner, there's a little WX subscript that stands for weather. So to access the weather frequencies, uh, you press that knob once, then channel two is our local weather. Sea is three feet. Sunday, northwest wind 10 knots. One thing to note is that you can't get out of the weather frequencies just by turning the channel knob. Uh, the weather frequencies are their own set of frequencies. So, to get back to the transmit and receive frequencies, yeah, must press the 16 button uh, to take you back to where you can make calls out or hear people calling in. The vessel is equipped with two navigation screens. Uh, if those don't come on with the batteries or the breakers, you just press and hold the power button until they light up. Those take a second to warm up, so we'll come back to them. The vessel trim tabs are here. Um, those work like the flaps on an airplane wing, uh, so you can press the bow up or down or side to side. These style and size of vessels typically work with the trim tabs retracted and also the engine tilted up a little bit. So to fully retract the trim tabs, you would press and hold the up buttons. If you were going into a head sea and you wanted the bow down for a smoother ride, uh, you could press the bow down, you see the indicator lights light up and show the position of the trim tabs. The fuel switch comes on with the breakers, fuel gauge. The, this vessel has about an 80 gallon fuel tank. Typical burn in a day has been 30 to 50 gallons of fuel. Um, it's important to note that this fuel gauge will only read accurately if the boat is stopped and relatively level. Uh, when the boat's up on step, it just reads full all the time. The window fan is located behind the upper GPS. The on-off switch for it is on the back of the fan. On these navigation screens, the 
lower screen closest to the helm is a touch screen, so it has similar functions to a smartphone or an iPad. Um, the, to access the full view chart, uh, first go home, then the options comes up for charts, and then navigation chart is the easiest to read. That brings up this image. So zoom in and out. Again, just like a smartphone, grab the screen and drag. We are the center boat icon. Uh, anytime the vessel moves, you'll see that icon move around the chart. We're going to clear out the navigation from the previous renter. Um, if the screen is uncentered from the boat, uh, this option to stop panning will come up. So to recenter the screen on you, uh, touch stop panning, then the screen will center on the boat and then it will also uh, refresh with the boat's movement. Very generally speaking on these charts, uh, blue is shallow water and white is deep water. So anytime I'm running a boat out of Homer, I just try to keep the boat in the white all the time. There are some rocks and reefs and things to watch out for. Garmin marks rocks by using an asterisk symbol. Which I'll try to show you on here in a moment. Uh, and so these little asterisks are the rock symbols. If you need to operate the blue boat in the blue, it's okay to do. Uh, but make sure you're zoomed in way on yourself so that you can see those images. If the screen gets zoomed out far enough, uh, the asterisks go away and you, uh, you can't tell where the rocks are. If you'd like to navigate to a specific spot on the chart, uh, you touch that spot on the chart, then it comes up with the option to navigate to and then go to. And once you've done that, it draws a beeline straight from you to your destination. You do have to watch out though, when that beeline is drawn by the GPS, there's no intelligence to it, so it will run you over rocks and reefs uh, and anything else. So even though you're following a line on the GPS, do make sure that you're paying attention to where you're at. To get rid of that navigation line, you go to menu, then stop navigation, and that clears it out. This lower screen also has a built-in fish finder on it. Uh, to access that, you go to home, then sonar, and then traditional is the easiest to read. That brings up this image. Um, what many prefer to do is use a split screen, so you have a half chart and half sonar. Uh, to do that on this machine, you just press the number one button and it will automatically come up. The upper chart plotter has similar functions, but it's not a touch screen. Um, so to operate this one, you use the buttons. Uh, for instance, if you'd like to navigate to a specific spot on the chart, you put the cursor where you would like to go, press select, and then the option to navigate to comes up. To use that, you hit uh, select again, then it comes up with the option to go to, select, and then it will draw a beeline straight to it. To get rid of that navigation line, you press menu, then go to stop navigation to clear it out. Anytime you've moved the cursor off the boat uh, to get it to center back on you, uh, just press back. Then the screen will center on the boat and refresh with it as it moves. Inside the passenger glove box we have a flare gun. Uh, there's zip ties for the breakaway on the anchor. Uh, the way we set up our anchors is to use a, a zip tie meant to be a sacrificial breakaway. Uh, the idea of that is that if the anchor gets stuck and you pull on it hard enough it will eventually break that zip tie and then that allows the anchor to pull out of its uh, hole in reverse. Also in here is a little day first aid kit. Uh, so that has aspirin and band-aids, etc. in it. We also have a full medical first aid kit which we keep on board. However, we ask that you take stuff out of here first so that the main kit remains intact if there's an actual emergency. Uh, also in the glove box are new ends for the downriggers uh, if those need to be redone. The control for the kicker engine is down low by the driver's helm. The kicker engine on this boat is connected with a tie bar to the main engine, so you can use the steering wheel to control the kicker. The tilt for the kicker is here on the side of the controller, uh, so before starting it, you'd want to make sure it's all the way in the down position. To shift it, press in the button, and that allows you to move the shifter. The shifter does have to be in neutral before the system will allow the engine to start. Uh, if you have any trouble ever getting the kicker to start, uh, just 
run it reverse forward and then find the neutral detent again and that will usually allow it to start. The key for the kicker is down low. Uh, to start the engine you just twist that. You don't need to do any choke or anything on here. Uh, the engine's brain will automatically adjust for fuel and air ratios. Then to shut it off, turn the key back the other way and always make sure to tilt the kicker engine up before running off the main engine. The fuel primer bulb for the main engine and kicker are located in the back uh, underneath the fish box. The location of the fuel primer bulbs <clears throat> is here. These engines typically don't need the primer bulbs to be pumped up, uh, but if you run into an issue with fuel, that's the place to start. Underneath the two seat boxes in the cabin, um, we have the item list in there labeled. So under the starboard seat box are two electric downriggers. Uh, there's also downrigger balls and clips, um, a tool kit, and then also a manual bilge pump. So the way the bilges are set up in this vessel, uh, they're created to be sealed bilges, so you'd never expect water to be in them. Uh, but if you found that water was there, you can use the manual pump out. Um, that works by pulling out the smaller black plug, putting this in here, uh, and then pumping to remove water from below deck. Also in the starboard seat box is a porta potty. Um, you're welcome to use the porta potty. Uh, if we, however, if you use it, we just ask that you clean it out. Um, one thing to note is the Coast Guard regulation is that uh, no potties can be dumped within three miles of shore. Um, that's not Enforce regularly, but you would want to make sure that it was dumped before you came back into the harbor. Underneath the port seat box are eight adult life jackets, four children's life jackets, cleaning supplies. There's also a paperwork box in there that has the engine and electronics manuals, um, as well as more flares and the full first aid emergency kit. Somewhere in the cabin will be the throwable PFD located right here. There are two fire extinguishers on the boat. One is below the port helm chair, and then the second is on the port side at the back of the wall. When adding fuel to the boat, the fuel cap is on the starboard rear corner of the cabin. The only trick on that is that on the forward edge of the cap is a detent button. You have to press that in before it will let you open the cap. The, this vessel is also equipped with an EPIRB. Uh, that's an emergency beacon. If that's triggered, it sends out a distress signal from our location of the Coast Guard. To access the actual unit, uh, you turn that blue dial counterclockwise, pull the lid off, pull the unit out of its cradle and then press the transmit button. One thing to note is that if you're in an actual life-threatening emergency, you need to make sure that you use all the available assets you have. So that would be cell phones, uh, the VHF distress button, uh, the EPIRB flare gun, um, and also calls out on the channel 16 on the VHF. The vessel has four halibut rods and reels, two salmon rods and reels, uh, full-size gaff, um, as well as a harpoon with tip and line. In the back is a fish box that has a hand gaff, the club, and the brush, uh, as well as sinkers and salmon flashers. Grab it down there. We'll take a quick look at the anchor system up front. This is the black hatch I referenced earlier. So if you found out the line wasn't going in smoothly, you can open up this hatch and manipulate it. Uh, additionally, if you found that the fuse had popped, uh, which controls the windlass, uh, that fuse is located here. Additionally, we'd earlier referenced that we use a zip tie up here, meant to be a sacrificial breakaway on the anchor. Uh, that's the zip tie, so it just needs to go around the chain and the anchor post. Then, a knife here, uh, if you get into trouble with the anchor and need to 
cut the line. Two, mount and operate the electronic downriggers on here. First pull out this screw pin. top pin goes through and you want to screw it in until all this silver is gone that's how you know it's fully engaged in the mount to plug in the downrigger there are two outlets uh, one by each downrigger labeled the plugs for the downrigger are twist lock design they'll only go in one way now once you get it in there give it a little twist counter uh, clockwise sorry and you will be engaged. Like that. Two, let out line on the downrigger. Uh, pull back this lever. That lever functions like a clutch on a car, so the faster you pull it back, the faster line will go out. Two, bring line back in. Uh, you press and hold the power button, bring it up. The downriggers have counters on them, uh, right there. That's it for our orientation on this 24-foot Baywell. Thanks for watching.